Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being on our program today. It's just such a delight to have two individuals here who are futuristic thinkers. They talk about the present, the past, but really their emphasis is about the future, trying to make us aware of a problem that is coming at us slightly from the side of uh, AI technology on the side of poverty, on the side of unemployment, on the side of the clashes of inequality that is coming in economics, a variety of issues. We're not here to present a particular idea. We're here to discuss the idea, and we invite you as the viewers to be part of it. Now, as we see both of the background, first of all, ladies first, uh, Leah, Leah Hamilton is a PhD. She's on the East Coast. She is a professor there, and she talks about poverty, and she's written for major magazines. She's written uh, uh, reviewed articles in the journals, and her whole area is to look at poverty area. So I'm very, very thankful for being on the program. Thank you for being on the show, uh, Leah. Thank you, Armando. And we have Andre Coelho. He is in Portugal, and he is uh, staying up late tonight to be on our program. So I really thank him for that. As far as I know, he's been laying around all day. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's playing marathons, and he's a musician, but he's also a PhD and an engineer, someone that I've come to respect over many, many years. I've learned a lot from him about basic income and more than that as well. So I want to thank Andre for being on the program. So thank to both of you. Thanks so Ellen. just a thrill to just, I'm just excited every time. So I really want to start with that. What we did is we started a discussion. Uh, author Martin Ford did a TED presentation and it was entitled, How We'll Earn Money in the Future Without Jobs. And he's a very uh, MIT professor talks a great deal about the impact of AI, reducing the number of jobs. So from there, let me leave it open-ended, and let me start with Dr. Hamilton. Okay. Um, so he talks he talks a little bit about the Luddite fallacy, which I think is important. So, so something in the basic income community we talk about a lot is how much of the the current job sector is going to be replaced. So in the United States, for example, there are studies that say AI is going to replace 9% of the, the, the job sector. And there are studies that say it's going to replace 50% of the job sector. And, and it's really difficult to, to, to estimate exactly which one of those is true. Um, and you know, based the, the Luddite fallacy says that that um, that people can't keep up with technology, right? So, so you know, the joke he made in the TED talk is that all the horses uh, were put out of work when we invented the car, or you know, farmers were were put out of work when we in, in uh, when we invented agricultural um, engineering, but you know. But what we didn't know in 1950, when when agriculture was going uh, mechanized, is that people would be software engineers. You know, so it's really difficult to predict what's going to happen 50 years from now. Where will the jobs be 50 years from now? But I think what we can safely say is that one whatever changes in the job market do happen will be primarily focused on people and not necessarily i know that the, like doctors and lawyers are being replaced by ai as well but it is going to hit low income people the hardest people who who do you know more more basic things service sector employees that sort of thing those are going to be hit the hardest and you know as the economy goes in waves even if those people are are you know, re-employed, retrained for other jobs in the future. Um, we know that 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 those cycles in the economy have major impacts on people, right? So, I think for me personally, one of the primary arguments for basic income is that it creates sort of a, a floor as our economy goes through those changes. So you don't have these huge swings in the economy where, you know, millions of people are left out of work or, or and, you know, and all the social problems that go along with it if we just create sort of a cushion so that we can keep innovating, keep creating uh, without major human costs. Okay, thank you. Dr. Coelho? Well, thanks, Leah. 
that's a hard one to you know <laughs> to surpass right now. <laughs> well, I think uh, what stru uh, strikes me when when I heard you talking it was that we often uh, we often think in a in a tight link between work and income, and that I think that that is um, that is bad for us, uh, especially in a in a present and in a near future where the automation wave is coming mm. in fast and we don't know exactly how fast mm. we 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 tend to think we tend to think that it's not as fast but these specialists like martin ford say and others say that it's faster than we think mm. uh, and so the automation wave i think is going below us below on a social level so it's going on but we are not aware of most autom automation uh, new things happening and uh, potentially replacing jobs in the near in the next few years, mm -hmm. and not only uh, routine jobs but also thinking wise jobs and the machine learning how to to do this uh, upper level uh, brain work like ourselves, right? Uh, and but uh, what, what what comes to mind? Uh, very often in the basic income debate is that we should be cutting this link between work and income because work isn't going anywhere. I said this a lot of times and in this show already uh, to, to you, Amanda, and the other guests, that work is not, it's not going anywhere. We are humans. Uh, we, we create things. We create spontaneously, yeah. uh, which means even, even if nobody is spiking us or, or lashing us, we still create things and work for it. Uh, work is not bad in itself. Uh, it, it, it's good if we're creating something we like. It's something that has meaning to us. And if I don't like what my neighbor does, it, that's fine because I don't have to. If he likes it, that's that that's the good thing. We all like different things, and, and the basic income would provide us with that freedom, which I, I think goes to the bottom of this discussion. Like Philippe Ampere has always said that to him, this is a matter of freedom. The one we don't have today. Most of us are stuck with jobs that, like uh, Graeber said, the bullshit jobs that go that don't go in nowhere. Mm -hmm. They're not satisfying. Uh, people are just routinely doing things that uh, they don't like, and so they, they go. They have the, their lives are restricted by it. It's only for this income we need to you know. To by food, by rent, by clothes, and uh, and it's not fair. Uh, one, so, yeah, yeah. One, no, one, no, thing, one, thing that, one thing that I never hear in the discussion, it's sort of like sort of in between the lines of what is presented. I think the, what I'm not hearing out of the discussion from uh, Martin Ford is the velocity of things. You, Andre, you mentioned it right now, the velocity of things. Mm -hmm. You know, we say this is coming, but we don't know when. The thing is, are we really talking about 20, 30, 40 years from now? Or are we, as we're sitting talking right now, using this technology, mm -hmm. are these changes now? And are the poor being impacted in a greater scale quicker? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that uh, that relates to that, and something Andre made me think of was that that you know, regardless of how much of the the economy uh, or the the work economy is replaced by AI, whatever is left, there's there's going to be higher competition for right, and then that's then that like you say has sort of a as a building effect. So there's higher competition, which means that people have to accept lower wages. I mean, you know, Francis Fox Piven has been writing about this for. Um, for seven, 60 years, that that um, that you that the economy requires more low wage workers than low wage jobs, so that they're competing against each other um, to keep those low those wages low. And and as uh, as we continue to to push more people out of the the workforce, eliminate more jobs, there's more competition. Wages are suppressed, which means there's to to to, to your point, Armando, and to um, 
to Martin Ford's point that that means there's fewer consumers in the economy. That means that that businesses begin to struggle. That means that they look for more ways to cut costs. So, it, um, you know, not being a, an AI expert, I, I can see just the 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 domino effect in the economy when you have more and more people out of work, you know, and we have things like um, like the gig economy that kind of can fill in some of the gaps um, as we as we move forward, which is great. But again, the, you know, these in these little piecemeal jobs, people aren't surviving. They're not thriving. So how do we create a basic income that creates a floor in that sort of rapidly changing economy? That you're right is I think is um, moves faster and faster. Leah, yeah, let me let me interject something really fast because yeah. because something you made me think about it right now. Uh, the logic, you know, uh, jobs will be lost, but don't worry, there will be new jobs, and yeah. if you retrain, you come into it. Okay, yeah. let me use that same logic. Something you just finished saying, I hadn't thought of it this way. So I talk. I, I have a presentation in front of the brick and mortar companies, mm -hmm. you know, here right now in, Lo in Los Angeles, I'll use Sears and yeah. some other stores. And I said, don't worry, your stores will shut down, but there will be other businesses. Look at Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. If I use that same logic, they're not going to go for it. <laughs> yeah. But the, the employees are sort of being sort of, I think, duped into the mm -hmm. idea that, oh, well, then I'm going to get a better job. Uh, again, I go back to the speed of technology. Yeah. I don't think we can retrain that fast. I think I saw an article recently that said roughly the exact same per number of people who lost their jobs in the retail sector gain new jobs in the with Amazon. You know that, like you know, the the same almost the exact same number of workers move from move from Sears, you know, in the department stores to Amazon, but now they're working for lower wages, and there's all sorts of questions about the the ethical treatment of workers in the Amazon warehouses, but because Amazon is such a behemoth, they, they, they don't have any, they can't just go work somewhere else because there's no more Sears, there's no more JCPenney's to go work at, right? So they don't have collective bargaining power that they, that they might have, but basic income gives them that collective bargaining power uh, that I can say, you know what, <laughs> this isn't worth it. <laughs> I'm at, you know, I'm out of here. And Amazon is automating everything. Yeah. Don't, don't fool, don't, let's yeah. not fool ourselves. They are yeah. automating away. Yeah. And they are tech giants they also. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so are. these workers, these, these workers that were fortunate enough, let's say, at the time to be there, they will, won't be there for long. For mm -hmm. sure, because they are automating mm -hmm. as much as they can. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would like to go uh, uh, back to, to Martin Ford's presentation because he. Uh, you know, initially he says uh, that we will remain indispensable to the economy or, or that uh, it had to do with this phrase, indispensable to the economy. And I thought, what are you saying, man? We are the economy. Yeah. This is not something external. Uh, mm -hmm. We are, uh, we should be, I think, indispensable to ourselves because if we're not, uh, <laughs> we would die. <laughs> I had seen that. I had not seen that. In a philosophical approach. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If we, if we take this on a philosophical approach, then the basic income is a way to provide acceptance. We are saying to people, oh, yes, we accept you. We accept all of us to be full capable members of society. Not, not something that's uh, like a stick finger saying if you work hard you will be indispensable to the economy <laughs> i think this is philosophically wrong yeah don't you agree yeah right your value comes from your productivity basically you are you we are we don't know i don't know what my 10 year old daughter will be doing in 15 years mm -hmm. i don't yeah and who am I to judge if whatever she'll be doing is wrong or, uh, mm. or not useful to society? I can't judge that. Yeah. 
only she can judge that, and the people who like her job will, will judge that. Yeah. You know, in this whole discussion of uh, Martin Ford and what you, putting it together with what you guys are saying, very valuable, is that they're not, nobody's saying work is going to go away. I think they're saying this is the kind of uh, more productive work, uh, helping the communities, working in your own communities, helping people, each other, whereas before in the past, that was not something you would be paid for. But with basic income, now you are free mm -hmm. and actually rewarded, if I read his wording right, you actually can be additional rewarding for doing certain projects. You're working on certain public issues. So I don't think I've heard anybody say all work is gone. What I'm hearing is that, unfortunately, if your job is redundant, your job is gone. Yeah. Yeah, I think I thought that, that's an interesting point. I, I made a note about that because whenever someone says we should use basic income to incentivize behavior, it makes me very nervous. So I do welfare research. And we've been trying to, to change the behavior of the poor through welfare incentives for as long as welfare is, has existed. We started, you know, in, at least in the United States, we started in the early 20th century. We're trying to only give it to, um, to widowed mothers to, dis to create disincentives for single parenthood. Um, now we're still today, we're, we're uh, trying to keep uh, women on welfare from having more babies. And the, 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 out, the outcome of all of these things is usually it's ineffective and sometimes it's actually harmful when we try to change human behavior. There's some things we do through public policy that, that are effective in uh, changing human behavior. So for example, like creating automatic um, uh, retirement savings. Those things are effective at increasing people's retirement savings. But, uh, and, you know, another example of, of behavioral incentives gone bad is the mortgage interest deduction. So, so people love deducting their mortgage interest. At, sorry, sorry, Andre, this is a very United States specific thing. People love deducting their mortgage interest from their taxes, but it's actually made people buy bigger houses that they can't afford. It's actually increased, um, mortgage debt it's actually increased housing prices so now poor people are priced out of of uh, buying houses which in the in the in the end has actually decreased home ownership rates by five percent according to economists so sorry that was a total sidetrack but my point is <laughs> <laughs> my point is we have to be really careful i think about trying to shape human behavior through public policy because a lot of times we get it very very wrong but to your more important point is that that we do need to to compensate people for the unpaid labor they do in the, in the world and more to the point women do a lot of that work right so so uh, there was a study that if women in the United States were compensated for all of the unpaid labor they do in the household they get like seven thousand dollars a year and that's just on average right so we do we do more care work of children of elderly um, and Armando to your point volunteering in the community so basic income would give people the flexibility to do those things I'm just very nervous whenever we try to say let's incentivize people to do a certain behavior because we usually do it terribly if I can yeah, if I can ask you a question if I can ask you a question and yeah. I know you know this is a spiraling night question <laughs> let me th let me throw an idea a, a question uh, yeah. an economic question to you Leah very quickly if you took all the people that are on welfare for whatever reason they're on welfare mm -hmm. all of a sudden you removed them all and you said okay everybody's going to go to work and everybody said okay and everybody went to work are there really enough jobs for everybody uh so that's what happened in 1996 clinton ended welfare as we know it so everyone has uh five years in their whole lifetime uh, 24 months in any one stint. Um, so we removed something like we've got like something like 70% less people on welfare than we did in 1995. So, no, so the answer to your question is no, that you don't go out to the economy and just find new jobs. There was that just means that there's fewer jobs for other people out there, or they're taking um, they're taking sub poverty level wages. Um, so they're increasing the competition. Like I said before, they're increasing the competition for the low wage um, uh, jobs that already exist. 
And and argue. And what's really ironic about this whole thing is that it's often low income mothers with young children who are spending more money to pay for their children to go to childcare um, than they are receiving from these low income jobs. And we don't have enough childcare assistance in the U.S. at least. Um, but like, but it, we do really really dumb things like you can get um, credit for watching if you're a welfare recipient. You can get work credit for watching someone else's children, but not yeah, your own not children. Your own. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Whoa. so, oh so, it, and then what some states do is they can, they have, they have um, work requirement that they have to hit a certain target level of, of their, the welfare recipients at working, but they can do things like um, put them in work training to meet that target level but they don't have, there's not effective, you, you know, somebody who maybe is escaping domestic violence or, you know, has less than a high school diploma. You can't put them in a two week training program and make them suddenly um, ready for any job or a well paid job. So what they'll do is they'll stick them in a room for eight hours with a trainer who says nothing. And they said, okay, we met our work target um requirement federal government because these people were in work training for for eight hours a day and they're just sitting there in a room um so there's all sorts of stories about about these these requirements and and how no they don't most people leave the program because they hit the time limit uh i think it's like i want to say 10 percent of people leave welfare because they found a great job that can now pay their bills <laughs> 90% keeps swirling around. Right, right. They, yeah, exactly. And, and they call that um, they call that programmatic churn, right? So they, they leave because they either, usually because they, you know, were sanctioned for like not meeting their paperwork or whatever, um, um, or because they hit their time limit and then they go into, you know, either um, no income or very, very low income and then they come back to the program. And that the, bureauc the bureaucratic costs with that are, are mm -hmm. incredible. You know, you know, sorry, Leah. We'll yeah, go, go ahead, Andrew. Go ahead. I, I just, I just recall. I just reminded that our uh, in the the medicine, in the medicine realm, mm -hmm. uh, our bodies are actually capable of of controlling or fighting any disease, mm -hmm. any disease. Okay, we might our bodies might not be as fast to identify the disease and treat it inside, you know, with our immune system. Mm -hmm. So what doctors uh, do uh, in some cases is trying to, to push back on the disease for a while to gain time so that our, our bodies can understand what's happening and then the treatment starts. Mm -hmm. the, tre the, the real treatment, mm -hmm. which is our bodies mm -hmm. getting rid of the disease. These uh, social security stories re remind remind me that we are trying to replace the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can't. Yeah. That's first. Second, it's never going to be as as effective ever. Yeah. The body is always better at doing that because it's four million years old. Mm -hmm. It's been evolving since we don't know when, many many years ago, and so it's not like in a hundred years that we are going to solve this disease because we have techniques and policies and we, we are not. I think the better way is to simplify this with a basic income yeah. and let the body, which is society, mm -hmm. do the rest. And yeah. we'll do it because poor people are not stupid. Poor people just don't have money. Yeah. yeah. If I, if I, tomorrow I would, you know, be broke. I would be, you know, the same person, but with no money, so I would be poor. Yeah. There's nothing I, more to it. I'll take on that argument. I'll take on that discussion. I, I will take it on. The body has, governs itself, okay? But I don't know. It's up here, down here in the heart. I don't know. But it governs itself. Out here in social policy, government has to make policy. That's not inside. That's outside. And policy is being made by politicians. And I'm not... I'm not confident that politicians are are really looking at the increase of poverty because of AI. That's sort of a mm -hmm. seems like that's an issue we keep going around 
Martin Ford is going around it, and we're talking we about. Have, it. Did I miss you have numbers on that? You have numbers on this relationship between AI and increased poverty. That would be um, interesting, though. Uh, well, we know that it's, it's, I mean, it's hard to separate historical events, right? So, so because that we know that the poverty rate in the United States has gone up, but we, you know, at the same time that AI has been increasing, um, we've been cutting people off welfare at the same time. And that's, um, and that's arguably because as globalization increases, American workers are now in competition with workers in China, you know, workers, workers everywhere. So, so employers don't have incentives to pay people well. So all, and then, uh, and then we have to cut people off welfare so that people have incentives to go take these terrible jobs that are in competition in a globalized economy. So anyway, so to your point, it's difficult to separate all these factors that are happening at the same point, right? Um, Come on, guys, we're dancing around the question. We're dancing around the question. Are we going to have, are we going to have more unemployed people? I, I think it depends on how you define work, right? Just to Andre's point. In a position where you're making an income. Yeah. These studies, the, the, ones, the ones I consulted, which were not many, uh, predicted losses. Net, no, yeah. net losses, uh, which means extinction of jobs yeah. on a certain percentage and uh, for different sectors, but they predicted the losses. Uh, and that's in very, if we don't have anything in place uh, to restore equality on the income level, uh, mm -hmm. we will have more employment and uh, yeah. poverty will rise. That, that seems to be a direct consequence. But of course, the jobs, the new new things are being invented every day, and of course, people will do different things. That's not also the question because that's always been the case. We we are an evolving species, as all species on this earth. So uh, um, uh, I I'll take differ with that. We also have a record of extinction, and now we're not by meteors, just extinction by ourselves, fighting uh, amongst ourselves. 99% of all species on Earth have already been extinct. But there's still <laughs> life on Earth. Okay? We are not going anywhere soon. At least life uh, in general. I, I hope so. That's why we're having the show. I'm not sure. Wasn't there well, a... Let's, you know, Leah, let's go put ahead. basic income in place so we can start think thinking. Because as a species, we're not thinking. This, I think I this is a downward spiral. And if we don't do anything about it, we will eventually get extinct, and, and, and life goes on. Yeah. Life goes on, you know. So, Armando, you were asking a question about are are policymakers thinking about these things? Are they thinking about increasing poverty? And um, and and made me and Andre, your point about about climate change made me think about it. So, I just saw a report the other day that's like the earth will be uninhabitable to humans by like 2050 or something very, very soon. I don't know if that's true, but it, it's to Armando's point. No, public policy lawmakers are very, very bad about thinking about in the future. Uh, you know, the, their job is to get elected. So they need to get elected this year, not, not 50 years from now. So they're not thinking about these things very well. Um, and whether it's climate change or increasing poverty, and and you could also be, um, you know, my my cynical side says that politicians' biggest donors have a lot of interest in increasing poverty because then they don't have to pay people as much. The workers will just accept anything they want. Wow. So so what's their incentive to to increase a living wage until something like you know historically when they pay attention is when the French Revolution happens is when you know the, the, the history of, of workers rights is you keep them just happy enough that they don't revolt but then every once in a while there's revolutions and then and then people in power have to say oh <laughs> now we have to actually do something sorry You're sorry <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah the last hundred years yeah. So during the French Revolution, uh, the the British monarchy increased aid to to poor people something like sevenfold because they realized, oh, we don't want one of those. No, thank you. The guillotine uh, was busy, so yeah, they, exactly. they had an incentive to help. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to bring a point that Andre he's been on our show many multiple times and this is why I really thank you. And I'm going to share something that he shared with me almost at the beginning when we first started the shows and it just stuck to me. The idea of basic income did not come from professors studying poverty. It did not come from humanitarian issues. It started out of Silicon Valley. So the moment he told me that, then I had to withdraw. And I says, why are they so invested in telling people, you know, we're in the AI business. We think we should look at basic income. Once I saw that connection, I thought, okay, Andre's got this way ahead of me. And I'm following his trail and his dust, but I'm starting to get it thanks to him. And I still bring that issue that you brought up. That you know, basic income is coming out of Silicon Valley. It's not coming out of the sky. Maybe I said. Maybe this is what I said. Please. Not that the idea came from Silicon Valley, but that they voicing it did an impact, mm -hmm. and it's it's much more loud. It's much louder than any poverty activist around. Sorry, Leah, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> just pops out. Yeah and says, let's put basic income online, people yeah. will kind of listen to him in a way yeah. Yeah. because there are millions yeah. of them uh, on Facebook. Because there's, and, he's a uh, billionaire, that, so he must be right, right? <laughs> he must know what he's that, talking that, about. <laughs> sure. No, I think that that's a, the, the connection here is that he's on the top front of technology advancement. Yeah. He knows something we don't. Yeah, yeah. And if he says this, it's probably because it's much worse, let's say, much worse <laughs> yeah. uh, than we thought it was. Robots are like around mm -hmm. tomorrow, the week yeah. after, something yeah. like this. Um, well, the person I would like, I, I, Andre, you got. I would like to go back to Martin Ford on, on something I think is important because at the end he think he says that oh let's incorporate some incentives and that's why. When Leah said in sentence, my, my bells also rang because I don't like that. Incentives all, always remind me of conditions. Mm -hmm. And it's the opposite of what I think basic income should be, which is unconditional. And that should be like gold. Mm -hmm. Because if we're introducing conditions, we are uh, invariably going to try and nudge behavior. Yeah. Oh, because if we introduce uh, this incentive for high school uh, finishers or for this volunteering blah 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 in the community, uh, they get more. Yeah. That that brings the wrong message. That we're not all equal. That we make bad choices. People make bad choices sometimes because they are sick, because they had a terrible childhood, because they were beaten up when they were young, because they didn't have the opportunities, because. The list can go on and on, but it's a psychological, uh, a psychological defect, uh, uh, like a, like a pro the psychological problems. People behave like that because they have problems in their life. My my life is also not perfect, and sometimes um, that comes to reality. I get angry, or I get, uh, or I get a little uh, sad, or something. It's it's not because. Um, I need to be nudged, but yeah. I need to to look back and understand that I'm valuable. Like it's not my fault that my parents made this mistake or that mistake, uh, and and I have to deal with it right now as an adult. And I think basic income brings that message. It it trusts people. Yeah. Look, here's this money. We are closing our eyes, and you will. You know, buy this baby food. You're not going, we are trusting you're not going to buy this liquor because you don't need the liquor. You need this baby food and to pay the rent. Uh, so when he talks about high school's incentives, I, I disagree. I think uh, that, 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 defeats, that defeats the original message of basic income. You know, I always get the message, and, and I, I understand what you're saying is it sort of is diluting the benefit of basic income. The concept that 
fundamentally, you're giving people money so that they don't have to go below the poverty level. They don't have to go out and steal. You know, they can sit home and drink a beer. I do too, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to go steal for it. I don't have to go steal for bread. I don't have to go steal for things. Mm -hmm. And I may use a, misuse a portion. That's a judgment call. But it doesn't require people to be out going through the trash cans. So uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the research on scarcity. Uh, Eldar Shafir did a really great TED Talk on scarcity that basically, and I think it's, it's sort of to the point of, um, oh, Roger, I'm going to mess up his last name, but he did that, the, the TED Talk about, you know, uh, poverty isn't a lack of character, it's a lack of income. But basically, the, the research behind scarcity is that not having enough makes us make bad choices and it's not the other way around it's not that making bad choices makes people poor it's that when you've got so much cognitive mental load going on how am i going to pay the bills how am i going to take care of my children uh, how am i going to get to work without reliable transportation we just we make bad choices and that's not just just poverty things like um, you know, when I talk to my college students about this, um, it, it, the applicable thing is time scarcity. When you have very little time, let's say you have an impending deadline, do you always use that time productively and wisely? No, you don't. You know, sometimes when we're, we're faced with a scarce resource, we don't use that resource super effectively because our brains get... Um, overloaded on what the researchers call mental bandwidth. We only have so much mental bandwidth. So having your basic needs met through a basic income allows people to do what Andre's point is, is, you know, uh, heal thyself to, the, to use the old um, saying that that if you have things going on in your life, having a basic income floor, having your basic needs met, allows people to to get counseling for, for mental health issues, to address addiction problems, um, whatever it may be, or if, you know, address things that might be interfering in, in positive parenting. Um, you know, I can tell you as the parent of a toddler that parenting is really stressful. And if I was also dealing, you know, with with all the issue, the weight of poverty, it gets even more stressful. So um, I think that's another really important point when we're talking about the behavior of the poor. To Andre's point, it's not that, that it never occurred to the poor that they need to be doing X, Y, Z. It's very difficult to do those things when you're living in scarce conditions. And, and uh, you know, this little public policy lever is usually not what people need. They need to, they need us. That's sort of the overriding message of my research is let's just get out of poor people's way. Just you know, stop trying to change their behavior. You know, stop treating them, you know, stop infantilizing the poor really, you know, help them meet their basic needs. And most people can, can figure it out. Most people can, to Andre's point, heal themselves. Well, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the program, and I think uh, if we let time go on, we could be here all day. I mean, there's just, both of you are just so brilliant. I applaud both of you. So we're going to start with uh, closing statements. Who wants to go first? Andre, I feel like I've been talking too much. Do you want to go first? So I can, yeah, I can <laughs> close first then. Uh, I, I had an extra point for... Uh, concerning Martin Ford's presentation, I think I will use that use this extra minute for for that because he he talked about safe unsafe he used these words safe unsafe and threaten human jobs. I think this language is also it's also so insinuative. It it opposes humans to machines, and this is nonsensical because we are building these machines. Uh, they, they, the machines, are a part of us. Mm -hmm. It's not as if there is an army of machines out there and we are being, <laughs> our jobs are being erased by them. This, we, I, I think we have a difficulty in, in, in looking at the, at the big picture. I, I, I know we are limited in size and in cognition, but uh, it's, I think most people that I talk to uh, cannot really see too much above, uh, beyond their own lives or beyond their relatives or beyond what happens on TV. Uh, and, and that's a limitation because, because in this 
case of machines and humans, the, the big picture, I think, it's not that difficult. It's just that we are building these things and they can all they can uh, be programmed because they are computers. They are, can be programmed to help us or or not, or, or they will be our, our uh, in our deathbed. Uh, and, and we have a choice to make. And that choice involves everyone, not just engineers that that making these machines or entrepreneurs but social policy experts uh interviewers uh webcast webcast uh, hey, show, hey show guests, watch like. it buddy watch it <laughs> uh, but that's a choice we have uh, glo uh, as a so as a society to use these machines to our developments and to make this human species better and happier Lee, Leah. Um, yeah. So I'll just yeah, turn. kind of bring it back around to to what I what I know about. So you know, my research for the last ten years has been all about welfare policy in the United States, and what what I keep finding over and over again is that the things that we set up our current safety net come so contingent on really really low income limits, really really low financial asset. Um, limits that people are actually discouraged you know that the takeaway from all this research is that people are actually discouraged from things like taking part-time work or starting small businesses and these are things that are going to be critical in a future economy that's you know that's gig based um, you know in in a, in a gig based economy where people are sort of have have um, really uh, uh, big ebbs and flows in their income, they can't be going on and off welfare because it's a huge bureaucratic cost to have people going on and off welfare and reapplying every time. And um, so, so what we're doing in our current safety net is actually discouraging workers from seeking the kind of opportunities they're going to be so critical in this, you know, AI future, whether it's part time or gig work or, or care work. So we have to build a safety net where people are allowed to, to pursue those things to fully participate in the economy without it being um, a harm to them. Thank you. Well, wow. saying and that, I, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put together ideas that you guys have presented. Martin Ford's book, his presentation, and I come up with this. Um, the sentence that I hear a lot, constantly, commonly, is computers will take over people's jobs. There's no argument about that, right? Yeah. We hear that all the time. And what always goes through my mind is, no, computers are not going to take over the jobs. The owners of the machines will put them to take over the jobs of people. They will prefer to hire a machine than to hire the individual. Yeah. This is my opinion. That's number one. The second part that I've always been concerned about the whole welfare issue is to me, and, and Leah mentioned it, um, when you give away billions of dollars either in money or incentives not to pay taxes that's a form of welfare yeah we don't seem to have a problem giving uh, amazon you know tax cuts in the billions of dollars but we seem to have a concern giving people enough money so that they can buy food yeah and to me it's just that's a hypocrisy that i've been hearing since i was a small kid that's my opinion, but I sort of your conversation has brought these two issues to the surface. And the other thing that I want to correct myself and then close with giving you guys the floor back again is that, Andre, when Silicon Valley and MIT on both coasts, premier places of AI in the world, not exclusively, but the major ones, when they're both saying, let's study basic income, I think we better all listen. This kind of program or that kind of program, I'm not sure, this tweak it here and tweak it there, that's open for debate. But we need to say the word basic income and grow comfortable with it and some form of it has to be in place before we have to panic and say, oh my God, what do we do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Andre, your closing statements and then. So the Leah. closing statements of 
The closing statements. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> closing statements. Yeah, I took the floor, so I figured, hey, I gotta. Give <laughs> I got some more to say now. <laughs> no, no, I gotta give it to you guys. I gotta respect you guys. Uh, okay, safe and safe. Let's see. Let's see. Lee, Leah, uh, uh, you first. I, I have to. Think. <laughs> Well, you're I like the way you did it. Yeah. Next. Yeah. I know that wasn't fair. Yeah. I think I covered my my high points. I just want to say thank you so much for having me. This was really great. Yeah, I think I think I'll go with that too, Armando. <laughs> yeah. It was a great fun. Uh, basic income has has a lot of implications. That could be my final final statement. Basic income has a lot of ramifications. The guys from the tech tech worlds uh, are thinking about AI and unemployment, uh, policy experts uh, are worried about uh, poverty, specialists are worried about poverty, um, libertarians are worried about liberty, people don't have enough of it, there are implications, uh, gender, uh, racism, there are all these social problems that come from, from a generalized scarcity we are we are born and learn that the world somehow is scarce and uh, you know food is scarce energy is scarce and jobs are scarce money is scarce everything is scarce and what happens uh, when when people feel constrained by scarcity leah has already said it we stress and because we stress our cognitive band our men mental band goes down and so we we don't think as much uh, we don't we don't appeal to our emotional uh, you know the good part of us and so we we keep on doing bad choices and that degrades uh, um, what's happening even further so, so we need to relax you know, relax for once and and reduce the complication uh, reduce the tweaking and the nudging and put basic income and you know sit back and watch because it will be Nothing we have seen before. in my closing statements on my closing statements is the Not idea sure that, that, you know, very few people talk about the future because I think we need to plan for it. And I have had the honor of knowing Andre. He's helped me so much to orient me and he's brought together a, a community of wonderful people. Leah Hamilton, PhD as well, to add on to the discussion to help us see the future and make policy for our children because I think Andre said it best. What are, what are our kids going to do? And Leah, you're a mom yourself and we are all asking the questions. And I me, mean, perhaps in the future as a grandfather. What are our kids going to do? How do we establish a society today instead of being reactive? You're working to be proactive and I'm just very proud to be part of both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ladies and Armando. gentlemen, thank you for being here. Oh, it's time. always a pleasure. You guys are always have an open door. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions about the show, please contact me. If you have any comments for either one of them, send them to me, and I'll make sure I'll forward it to them as well. Uh, you can write me and contact me at afsanchez66 at gmail.com. Again, Dr. Hamilton, Dr. Coelho, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, and I look forward to having our next show and continue this discussion as well. Thank you. Adios. Bye-bye. Adios.